Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Dracula. We are familiar with the names of American monsters feasting on the life force of regular people. Here in what is supposedly Canada, we have our own fair share of unique monsters. You got your Irvings, your Doug Fords, we even got Ogopogo. The last one's a real cryptid. Today I'd like to talk about one such monster, a fiend and or ghoul named Galen Weston Jr. Who is... Allegedly. Using the smokescreen of inflation to gouge my home country and its citizens by massively jacking up the price of groceries. Weston is the chairman and president of Loblaws, the largest chain of grocery stores in Canada and parent company of most of the smaller grocery chains in Canada. Get used to hearing the word Loblaws a lot? Get the arrested development jokes out of your system, please? Actually, I was going to stay in my office tonight and work on my law blog. Of course, the blah 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 law blog. <laughs> wow, you, sir, are a mouthful. G-Money earned this position through a lifetime of hard work, elbow grease, and being the son of Galen Weston Sr., whose holding company owned a controlling share of Loblaws. Now, he may look like the human equivalent of putting water on cereal instead of milk, but don't let his Ned Flanders appearance fool you. Behind his lifeless dead eyes, there's a lifeless dead soul, eager to hoard as much of everyone else's money as he can get his little claws on by whatever unscrupulous means he can devise. Now, obviously... It would be libelous to insinuate that Galen Weston is personally responsible for every action that Loblaws and their many baby corpos undertake. It's just that Weston has made the conscious decision to become the face of the brand, appearing in ads and commercials, and I can't imagine anyone asked him to do that. Across the country, the way Canadians buy their food is changing. Yeah, it's getting more expensive. Right. Sorry, what? Galen, we can't say best according to legal. What? Why? We use a unique blend after roast technique. That makes it the best. So the premise of this one, the premise of this commercial that he made, he made on purpose, is that his employees are trying to make sure that he stays on message, but he's frustrated with them and is very difficult and tries to boss them around. Best. 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 It's just legal. That's just the way it is. I don't know this for certain, but it had to be his choice, right? Because he's about as likable as the feeling of wearing socks in the shower. Nobody else would think it would be a good idea. So like, for better or for worse, dude, you represent Loblaws, like you are Loblaws. When we talk of Loblaws, we talk of Weston and vice versa. Also structurally, it just makes sense to have like a kind of figurehead character that you can get mad at, even though it's not really an individualized problem. There are structural factors which make people like Galen and his actions inevitable. That's just a little bit of storytelling magic, you know, but by no means should we come away from this thinking that the problems I'm about to discuss are the result of a single bad actor. Rather, they are the unavoidable end result of corporate control over necessary goods and services. But that's not as fun. Food prices are skyrocketing in Canada right now. You might have heard viral news stories about a chicken breast costing a whopping $40. Last year saw average grocery prices rise by about 10%. And this year, Canada's food price report forecasts another 5-7% to increase, which might sound alarmist, but that's also the amount it predicted last year when the increase actually doubled that. This is amidst a general cost of living crisis that is squeezing the country particularly hard right now. According to Statistics Canada, one in three Canadians above the age of 15 is living in a household that reported finding it, quote, difficult or very difficult to meet its financial needs despite rising employment across most industries. Anecdotally speaking, can confirm. According to a report from Food Banks Canada, in March 2022, there were nearly 1.5 million visits to food banks in Canada, the highest March usage on record, even though unemployment rates were at their lowest on record in the same month. Now let that part stew in the old brain meat for a second, because people will often tell you that the reason there are so many people struggling to make ends meet is because of laziness, or too many people mooching off of welfare, or whatever cockamamie fantasies they have contrived to allow themselves to believe that the world is fair. In fact, more people than ever were working at the very time when more people than ever had difficulty getting food, the very thing that working is supposed to be for. According to the survey respondents, the top three reasons people accessed a food bank this year were food costs, low provincial social assistance rates, and housing costs. They also reported increases in the amount of senior citizens and indigenous peoples using the food banks. And one third of the people using food banks were children. In other words, this crisis is hitting the most vulnerable people in the country the absolute hardest. We should keep in mind as we proceed that while people like me no doubt suffer from rising food costs, the people who suffer the most, the people who will grow ill and die as a result, are the poorest, most underserved people in the country. 
As always, they are bearing the brunt of this. So you have to be a real piece of garbage, just like a complete monster to generate enormous corporate profit from that situation, wouldn't you? I mean, you know, like like if children don't have food, that would be a bad time to make, I don't know, off the top of my head, just random number. But, but let me think here, $180 million. That'd be kind of sickening, wouldn't it? That type of money. And now is the part where you expect me to say that Loblaws made $180 million in profit in 2022. But of course, that would be ridiculous. Pause for emphasis. Because they made $180 million above their previous best performance in the past five years, totaling $436 million, according to a study conducted by Dalhousie University's Agri-Food Analytics Lab. To put that number in perspective, if you got a dollar every minute of every day, $436 million would still be a lot of f***ing money. And you don't. You don't get a dollar every minute of every day. Now, let's not rush to judgment here. The study categorically does not attribute that excess profit to anyone using the pretext of inflation to justify jacking up prices. In fact, funnily enough, the website where I found this study, The Daily Hive, even takes careful note to mention that. However, authors of the report, Samantha Taylor and Sylvain Charlebois, say they did not find these companies guilty of, quote, greedflation, which the report defines as taking advantage of high inflation to earn excessive profits at the expense of consumers. Quote, rather, we conclude that based on the performance of their gross profit, Loblaw Companies Limited are outperforming even their best gross profit performance in recent years, while at the same time, many Canadians face tremendous financial hardship attempting to satisfy their basic needs of heat, shelter, and food, reads the report. Not exactly an exoneration, but still. Although one thing the Daily Hive left out of its analysis of this study that might be relevant is that the study also doesn't rule out greedflation either. The study states in the exact previous paragraph to the one they quoted, we based our analysis on publicly available data aggregated such that we will likely never be able to prove or disprove greedflation amongst Canadian grocers. This will remain the case until they are willing to open their books for additional analysis, something not even Canada's Competition Bureau can compel them to do. So they're not exactly saying in the study that price increases are not the result of greedflation, just that we can't know for sure that they are or are not. Feels kind of like an oversight to me there, Daily Hive. Real whoopsie doodle. And I mean, jokes aside, I don't say this to cast aspersions on the journalistic integrity of the Daily Hive, but to illustrate the ways that Canadian corporate media has to kind of tiptoe around this kind of subject matter, not only because Loblaws is a big company with a lot of lawyers, but also probably by a lot of ads. To be transparent, though, it does seem to be the opinion of at least one of the study's authors that the perception of greedflation is misguided. I'm referring, of course, to Dr. Sylvain Charlebois, the food professor. I think that's how you say his name. Maybe not. I'm not going to check because it's way more fun to say it this way. Anytime somebody wants to impugn the fine reputation of our nation's top grocers, Dr. Food is there to stick up for him. But to be even more transparenter, Dr. Charlebois might have a little conflict of interest in the matter, considering the cheeky little 60k donation Galen tossed his team's way for research, which he likes to block people when they point out. He says that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter because he didn't get to keep the money. He used it to pay grad students. So there's no conflict of interest here. He gave it to grad students to do research for him that his team will get the credit and prestige for. And also when this was pointed out, any mention of the grant was immediately scrubbed from Dalhousie's website. So I don't think there's anything shady going on here, but I don't know. Maybe I'm being too cynical here. Maybe this doesn't affect his judgment. Maybe I'm rushing to judgment about the food professor. Maybe he's a very smart man with a lot of integrity and a deeply compassionate- You think it's appropriate to shoplift while grocery shopping just because you think food prices are too high? Crazy. The scenario he is responding to here is one in which a person literally cannot afford food and then steals it to survive. So what, what should we do, Doc? I guess just fucking starve then, like a good person should do. On December 5th, Lovelaw's executives were brought before Parliament to answer questions about how come prices are like that. How come the prices are so high? What, how come that happened? And they argued that, yeah, sure, they were making more dollars and cents, technically, 
sure, but the profit margins remain the same. So like, obviously they're not taking advantage here. It's just business as usual. Probably what's happening is that people are just buying more groceries. So who can say for sure? I don't think there's any problem here. Couple issues with this line of argumentation. Economist Jim Stanford at the Progressive Economics Forum points out, A, that's not quite true. While profit margins have remained relatively consistent, this year, sort of, we'll get to that. That's only because they jumped to new heights in 2020 and never returned to normal. B, I'm just going to quote this point because it's too complicated to summarize. Even in this scenario, the most generous one possible for the supermarkets, the companies have increased both the mass and rate of profit by one tenth for doing nothing other than, quote, passing along higher costs and then some to consumers. So the argument that a constant margin means they haven't profited from inflation isn't valid. And C, the amount of sales is actually decreasing, not increasing. So like, if the margins were the same, and they're not, we'll get to that later, and they're making more profit, that math does not add up. And D, according to a bunch of economic stuff I won't claim to understand, if the source of the problem were higher input costs, it would be very unusual for a company to maintain a consistent profit, let alone increase it. He therefore concludes, can we blame the problem of food price inflation on greed? Yes and no. Greed existed before COVID came along, but the combination of greed, more politely termed profit maximization, along with supply chain disruptions and consumer desperation during and after the pandemic, along with oligopolistic pricing power, clearly explains much of the pattern of recent inflation in Canada, especially for the essential commodities that have been the biggest drivers of inflation, energy, housing, and food. To claim that supermarkets and other firms are innocent conduits merely passing on higher costs is not empirically valid. Furthermore, according to a report from the Toronto Star, it's a little inaccurate to say that profit margins have remained consistent, considering that Loblaws has increased its gross profit margins 28 quarterly reports in a row, or seven years running for us non-business types. The Star shared its analysis with David McDonald, a senior economist with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, who said, it does appear that the pandemic has put the grocery industry on a new plateau with higher margins. Inflation, far from eating away at profits in this industry, has likely increased margins. Executives with Loblaws and Empire testified that profit margins have remained stable and flat since inflation started to take off. This is misleading because it minimizes how small changes in gross profit margins translated into massive amounts of money, said the CCPA's McDonald. In other words, stable or flat don't mean unchanged. They mean, well, they only changed a little bit, a little tiny bit. It's just that in such a high volume business, those tiny little changes mean enormous sums of money. So charitably, according to the experts, whether or not Loblaws and other large grocery chains are jacking up prices using the pretext of inflation to gouge the consumer is, let's say up for debate. We simply can't tell. Sure looks like it to me, but hypothetically, if you stated it as a fact, you might get sued. Because you can't prove it. Because under no circumstance can they be forced to disclose the information you'd need to prove it. So one question that arises then is, is that the type of thing it would be characteristic for Loblaws or other grocery chains to do? Has Loblaws under Galen's leadership ever been found to be engaging in anti-consumer behavior to distort market forces in their favor before? We on the left, we like to think that we've conquered bread. But we haven't. Yet. In March of 2017, Loblaws, among other top grocers in Canada, reminded us all of this simple fact when they got caught collaborating to fix prices on bread throughout the country. A bunch of the country's just top grocery companies got together and agreed to all raise their prices so they could all have more money. I, I really want to hit this point home because this is old news for Canadians, but Americans listening might not grasp the gravity of this. We know for a fact that George Weston Limited, of which Galen Weston is the CEO and chairman, and Loblaws were central to a literal criminal conspiracy to artificially and illegally hike up the price of bread across the country. They admitted that. We know that beyond the shadow of a doubt. We know for a fact that given the chance, they not only manipulated the market to raise food prices for profit, but they were central in an illegal plot to get everyone else to do it too. So like, it's difficult for me to trust that given the means, motive, and opportunity to jack up prices using the pretext of inflation, that any of these fuckers would hesitate particularly Loblaws or Weston. Also, while I was looking for a contemporary source to talk about this, I found this article from CBC that quotes our old buddy old pal Sylvain Charlebois, the food professor. Two months ago, if you would have asked me if there was any collusion in the industry, I would have said, likely not. That's so funny, dude.
Because here you are now championing this narrative that the poor widow grocers can't do anything to stop price increases. And everyone's being too mean to them. And, and right here, you're saying, boy, you know, if anyone had asked me about the likelihood of this horrible scandal that is definitely true, I really would have whiffed it. Well, at least you learned your lesson, Doc. You'll never give them the benefit of the doubt like that again. Now, unlike price fixing, making record profits selling food while the country deals with mounting food insecurity isn't illegal. I mean, presumably if there's a just and loving God, it would violate their laws, but in the laws of man, it's acceptable for some reason. But it's not great publicity. Historically, poor people not having adequate access to food has been one of the greatest sources of guillotining rich people. So Loblaws launched a real limp dick PR strategy to cover their asses. Firstly, Galen Weston himself personally sent out a mass email announcing a price freeze on 1,500 common household items in the no-name brand of products. That sentence might have been confusing if you're not Canadian. No Name is the name of Loblaws' in-house cheapo brand, or one of them anyway, because they also have President's Choice, but like, No Name is meant to imply that something is generic and unbranded, but in this case, it's branded with the brand name No Name to make sure that even if you specifically want to avoid paying premiums for brand name products, even if you were looking for that specific thing, your only alternative is their branded product. I never really thought about how sinister that was. Moving on! So, from October 17th, 2022 to the end of January 2023, prices on 1,500 no-name products would be frozen. And that's not nothing. I mean, it's pretty close to nothing, but it, you know, it's some, it is a, it is technically a thing. It's not an entirely empty gesture to freeze them in place. It's about as close as one could reasonably get. But as many people have pointed out, it tends to be the industry standard to like not adjust prices all that much during that time of year anyway. So it kind of feels like they just did what they were going to do and then expected to be congratulated for it while making record profits as the country struggled to eat. Also, by that time, prices had already gone up on no-name products significantly, so they were locking in the now higher prices, and only doing that much until January, after which point it was reasonable to conclude that people would still eat, and thus continue to require groceries. After which point, gloves are off, baby, we're gonna charge you a million dollars for a fucking broccoli, what are you gonna do about a bitch? Also in the email, Weston had this to say, Maddeningly, much of this is out of our control. Your grocery bill is higher today because the suppliers who make the products we sell are raising their prices for us. And while we've challenged and will continue to challenge any unfair price increases, the truth is most are reasonable. Suppliers' basic costs are way higher than they've been in decades. No different than costs like the gas in your car or your rent or mortgage. Okay. Okay. So we've addressed this already. That dog won't hunt. But let's grant this point for a second. Let's pretend he's right instead of probably lying. I'm not an ignoranus. I know that corporations have a legally binding fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders to generate the maximum revenue. I understand what Mr. Weston is saying here from that point of view. It's not like he can just knock down prices and eat the losses. He has to make as much money as he can, legally. Otherwise, his shareholders could sue his ass. But the thing is, I don't care. I don't care at all about that. And I guess the reason that I don't care is that you're making millions of dollars and the rest of us are having difficulty affording food and we really need food. So whatever market pressures exist on Galen Weston as a multi-billionaire don't fucking matter to me. So like, if you say, Galen, that it's outside of your control, what you mean is that you're not going to control it because the means by which you could control it are too expensive. You could, in theory, eat the losses. I mean, I don't have access to the books, and to be fair, even if I did, I wouldn't understand them. But like, you got $436 million in excess profits in 2022, which could be going towards mitigating this crisis for everyone instead of just making you rich. I don't know whether that would cover it. I highly doubt that it would, but when you're making that much money, it's pretty ridiculous to claim there's nothing more you could do, that it's out of your control. Again, I know he legally can't do that. It's not that simple, but like, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but if you're in a situation where you're legally forbidden from helping hungry people get food and you're being handed hundreds of millions of dollars to do that, I would argue that it kind of behooves you morally to at the very least speak up about how that's kind of fucked up. If you're benefiting to the tune of billions of dollars from a system, it's pretty tone deaf to shrug and say, well, you know, them's the brakes, that's the system. Wish I could help, but it's out of my hands. And then like spend the rest of your day just sipping 
President's Choice Mai Tais in your palatial Vero Beach summer house. Shut up, dude. Like, sh shut up. Why, why would you think this would mean anything coming from you? Why are you inserting yourself into this conversation? Sh just shut, shut up. The word maddeningly also just, huh, that makes me want to do crimes. Bad crimes. Is this maddening to you? Does it bother you, Galen? Is it keeping you up at night? Because you seem to be doing okay, actually, Galen. It doesn't seem like it would frustrate you all that much, Galen. Loblaws Companies Limited also released a statement urging customers to donate to Food Banks Canada. After all, I mean, they made 436 million last year and of that, they gave half a million away. That's 12% of 1%. But to make it easier for you, they made it so that now you can donate your loyalty points to food banks, which is great. Cause it's not like you could really use them anyway. They don't fucking buy anything anymore cause all the prices went up. And don't you feel better? Don't you feel like they're responsible corporate citizens now that they've encouraged the people they're robbing, allegedly, to pay themselves back? That ought to do it. Crisis averted. So now it's February 2023, and a couple of weeks ago, the price freeze ended, reigniting the criticism of how ghoulishly insufficient it was in the first place. To which Loblaws responded in truly the most brainless way it could have, by scolding people for criticizing them on Twitter. Fantastic idea, because if there's one place you're likely to win people over, it's that bird zone, baby, a space famous for its ability to calmly resolve conflict. While we may be the face of food inflation, but we are certainly not the cause. That sentence is... You didn't write that sentence right. You did it bad. Food prices are higher in our stores simply because the manufacturers who make the products are charging more for them. Holy shit, guys, take the L. Oh my God. Imagine saying the phrase, while we may be the face of food inflation and expecting anything to matter after that. We get it. It's easy to blame grocers for higher grocery prices, but on a $100 grocery bill, our profit is less than $4. Uh, oh, I had no idea. Good thing there's hundreds of millions of those grocery bills a year, though, is the thing. To quote once again from the Toronto Star, Carl Littler, an industry representative with the Retail Council of Canada, testified that supermarkets are a high-volume, low-margin industry. That's like saying selling multi-million dollar mansions is a low-margin business because the real estate agent only makes 2.5%, Jim Stanford said. Also, you sneaky little snakes, don't act like $100 is a common price point for a grocery bill right now. My last grocery bill was almost $300 for two people, and I mostly eat oatmeal. According to the Canadian Food Price Report, the annual food expenditure for the average family of four is predicted to be up to $16,000 in 2023. This is an increase of $1,065 from an observed annual expenditure for a family of the same demographic makeup in 2022. Back of the napkin math here, that represents a measly pittance of $628 annually in pure profit for you on each such family. No name has been described as the biggest price freeze in the world, and we're not done cutting grocery bills. This year, the average family will save thousands of dollars this year if they pick no name over the national brands. Galen, this is a good place to use the word maddeningly. First of all, describe that way by whom? Anyone can describe something as whatever they want. That doesn't make it true. I would describe Galen Weston as the largest single consumer of dog feces on the planet. Is that now a fact? Is that worth quoting to people? I'll let you decide. Secondly, nobody is denying that buying no-name products is cheaper than national brands, of which no-name is one. The problem is that they're not cheaper than they themselves were a scant few months ago, so that's irrelevant. You would only be saving thousands of dollars compared to a hypothetical version of yourself that bought more expensive shit, while in reality, you're spending much, much more than you had been especially considering that you also sell and therefore profit from the other national brands raising their prices, Loblaws. We can say with confidence, our profits aren't the reason for food inflation. Our grocery food margins are flat. Suppliers' costs to us continue to climb, pushing prices higher. We've covered this many times. That's not true, that's bullshit. Their profit margins have gone up continuously for seven years. But let's pretend though, let's imagine like they're not lying directly to our fucking faces. Of course your profits are at least part of the problem because you just pass on those costs to consumers in order to generate said profits. Were you not seeking profit, we'd have collectively saved $436 million. 
Furthermore, let it not go unsaid, Loblaws' suppliers do deserve a fair amount of the blame here. Jim Stanford points out that they too seem to be jacking up prices beyond merely what is explainable by inflation. I would add that the only reason they're able to get away with that is because major grocery chains, the only customers they have who can exert any kind of pressure on them to lower grocery prices, are perfectly happy to pass that increase in cost and then some along to consumers rather than leverage their buying power to negotiate for lower prices. We're not done cutting grocery bills. This year, the average family will save thousands of dollars this year if they pick no name over the national brands. How do you, how do you keep making that same typo? Now this one, oh, I just want to shit my pants in active protest. I feel such impotent rage that I am regressing to infancy and it makes me want to fill my diaper. But obviously it won't because like, who could afford diapers right now, right? If it's anything like the price of infant formula anyway, like how infant formula in one Halifax Shoppers Drug Mart went from $60 to $75 in a month. And guess who owns Shoppers Drug Mart? We're not done cutting grocery bills. What do you mean you're not done? You didn't start doing that. As we have firmly established, grocery bills have in fact gotten much, much higher. You didn't cut anything. You, you did a little price freeze. A price freeze is not a price cut. But also Loblaw's company's Twitter account, no, this year the average family won't save thousands of dollars this year because as I said, prices are projected to increase by five to 7%. The only way you're saving money is again, against the hypothetical version of yourself choosing to buy more expensive stuff. The same way that I am technically saving money each time that I choose to buy like gum instead of a PlayStation 5. So this guy responds to one of Loblaws' canned lines uh, with a screen cap of his CBC article about their soaring profits. Loblaws responds thusly. Per the rest of the headline, our increased profits have been led by sales of pharmacy items, cough slash cold, beauty, not food. Oh my God. Oh my God. The Weasley wording here. Yeah, that's true. The headline and article do say those words because they are describing a report from Loblaws. So Loblaws investigated themselves and found they did nothing wrong. And personally, I don't think it's much better, morally speaking, to make a buttload of profit off of medicine instead of food, but great job downplaying that by pointing out sometimes medicine is just for the sniffles. Also, like, the profits are being led by those categories, but that doesn't mean your increased profits are the result of those things, because in the article you're responding to here, Food retail same-store sales rose 6.9%, while drugstore same-store sales added 7.7%. And I know that you know that because CBC is literally reporting on your statements to shareholders. But also, Shoppers Drug Mart sells food and other grocery items. So even that 7.7% can't be attributed solely to high-margin items, not food. The only reference to said high-margin items is this sentence. In its drugstores, like Shoppers Drug Mart, revenues benefited from elevated sales of higher margin categories like beauty, cough, and cold, Loblaws said. That doesn't mean that other prices and other profit margins weren't going up. And they are reporting that you said that, not validating your claim that it is true or that it represents a meaningful challenge to the claim that you're jacking up prices as you are attempting to portray it here. It really bothers me that they took this tone in response to criticism really bothers me that in addition to making historic profits, this monolithic corporation feels so entitled to our goodwill and respect that they have the unmitigated gall to talk down to us in the middle of this crisis and act like we should be thankful for their beneficence. We're not even entitled to be upset that they sat back and let the money roll in while we, the people who made them rich, struggle to put food on the table. If it's true that Loblaws, along with other major grocery chains, are profiting from inflation and thus contributing to growing food insecurity, which again, I would not state as a fact because that would open me up to legal retaliation, but boy, there seem to be a lot of reasons to think that they might be. It's certainly not the only way that Galen Weston and his cronies are trying to screw over Canadians. He, alongside my province's premier and professional Mario Brothers movie King Koopa cosplayer, Doug Ford, are also working to undermine the single-payer healthcare system that Canadians, like pretty much every other country that has an even slightly competent government, have taken for granted for decades. And I'd love to talk about that right now, but as a result of the skyrocketing cost of living in this country, and the fact that my mortgage payments have doubled in the past year as a result, I'm doing great, having a lot of fun, I gotta produce more content, baby! So I'm splitting this one up part two next time, kids, unless this video does really bad, in which case I reserve the right to move on to something else. 
Hey, want to watch it early? Do you want to watch it before everyone else? Videos go live a week early on Patreon, except Cringe Corner videos, because other people work on those. And I would feel weird about doing that. Some of us got to work for a living, Galen. I know you're watching, Galen. I know you're eagerly awaiting part two, Galen. I know you're a big fan of my work, Galen. I know that you find Grubble Tum to be a particularly funny running joke, Galen Weston. I'm talking to you now. You're a multi-billionaire Nepo baby whose entire fortune is built on finding ways to squeeze more money out of the things Canadians absolutely need to have or we will die. To put that another way, you're the greatest extortionist in the country. It's just that the extortion you do happens to not only be legal, but the basis of our entire economy. Galen. Give your money away. Give it away. All of it. You shouldn't have it. You can, you can keep... You can keep like a million dollars, okay? That, that way you can like survive until you get a real job on your merits. I mean, you don't need that much, but I'm being cool here. I'm a cool guy and I'm being cool to you. So don't make me regret it, Galen Weston. Give your money away. That's what I think you should do. Hi, come into eyeball promotional segment. Due to budget cuts, I can no longer afford brand name eyeball zone. So I'm going with the knockoff version. Here in generic eyeball area, we promote people. Usually it's spooky and a lot of fun, but... A major theme of this video that will remain relevant in part two and most videos that I make is that private ownership of public infrastructure is disastrous. But what happens when that infrastructure is itself disastrous? What happens when you compound cruelty with more cruelty? In private prisons, the most evil industry in America, Siggy Snake gives a brief primer on the horrors, hypocrisies, inefficiencies, and corruption of the private prison industry in the United States. How it takes a system that was already unfathomably cruel and systematically makes it crueler in every capacity to max out profits. You know, just in case you weren't already frothing mad at rich people today. Do you have a small project you'd like to see featured here or in a branded equivalent of here? Send no more than one email to thoughtslimeeditor at gmail.com with the word eyeball somewhere in the subject line and pertinent details such as your pronouns, and perhaps you will experience an eyeball or eyeball-like promotion sometime in the near future.